I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the 14th chapter of the OpenStack Psychology Textbook. Today we'll be discussing stress, lifestyle, and health. And so we'll talk about what stressors are, the regulation of stress, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, we need to begin by saying that researchers have argued a lot about coming up with an acceptable definition of what stress is. So we'll go with stress is a process whereby an individual perceives and responds to events that they appraise as overwhelming or threatening to their well-being. Now, demanding or threatening events are often referred to as stressors. A primary appraisal involves judgment about the degree of potential harm or threat to well-being that a stressor may entail. So it could be viewed as a threat or a challenge. A secondary appraisal involves judgment of the options available to cope with stress and perceptions of how effective the options are. So a threat is seen as less catastrophic if the person believes that something can be done about it. So in many ways, stress is really a subjective experience. It's not so much what happens to you as how you respond to it. Use stress is a good kind of stress, and it's associated with positive feelings, optimal health, and performance. Distress is the bad type of stress, and when stress exceeds this optimal level, uh, it becomes excessive and debilitating. Distress is associated with fatigue, exhaustion, and decline in performance, and if it continues, your health also might be impacted. Now, the scientific study of how stress and other psychological factors impact health fits in health psychology, which is a subfield devoted to understanding the importance of psychological influences on health, illness, and how people respond when they become ill. Health psychologists investigate why people make certain lifestyle choices and the effectiveness of interventions for unhealthy behaviors. So, for example, when they look at stress levels, retired people have the lowest level of stress, not very surprising, and people who are unemployed with less education and income were the most stressed. Walter Cannon proposed that the fight or flight response occurs when a person experiences very strong emotions, especially those associated with a perceived threat. The body is rapidly aroused by activation in the sympathetic nervous system and the endocrine system. This arousal helps prepare the person to either fight or flee from a perceived threat. This is adaptive because it enables us to adjust internally and externally to changes in the environment. And that is Walter Cannon to the right. Hans Sale, who's also there to the right, incidentally discovered that when exposed to prolonged negative stimulation, stressors, rats showed signs of adrenal enlargement, thymus and lymph node shrinkage, and stomach ulceration. Sale realized that these responses were triggered by a coordinated series of physiological reactions that unfold over time during continued exposure to a stressor. And this is known as the general adaptation syndrome, which is the body's nonspecific physiological response to stress. The general adaptation syndrome, or GAS, uh, consists of three stages. So there's an alarm reaction, which is the body's immediate reaction upon facing a threat or emergency, and it's analogous to the fight or flight response. If the exposure to the stressor is prolonged, you enter a stage of resistance. This is when the body remains alert and prepared, but with less intensity. Over a long period of, of time comes the third stage, which is the stage of exhaustion, and you're no longer able to adapt to the stressor, and there is a depletion of physical resources. The physiological mechanisms of stress generally uh, involves the work of two systems, the sympathetic nervous system and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. In response to stress, the hypothalamus releases a corticotrophin releasing factor, which is a hormone that causes the pituitary glands to release ACTH, which then activates the adrenal glands to secrete a number of hormones into the bloodstream. So one thing's connected to the next, connected to the next. One of those things is cortisol, and that's uh, commonly known as a stress hormone and prov helps provide that boost of energy when we first encounter a stressor, preparing us to run away or fight. 
So let's change gears now and start talking about stressors, which can be chronic, meaning that they persist over a period of time, like unemployment or imprisonment, or they can be acute, which means that they're generally brief but intense. Now, uh, we'll start with talking about traumatic events, and stressors in this category include exposure to military combat, threatened or actual physical assaults, terrorist attacks, natural disasters, and automobile accidents. Men, non-whites, and individuals in lower socioeconomic status groups report experiencing a greater number of traumatic events than do women, whites, and individuals in higher socioeconomic groups. What about life changes? Well, many potential stressors we face involve events or situations that require us to make changes in our ongoing lives and require time as we adjust to those changes. And examples of this include death of a close family member, marriage, divorce, and moving. So researchers developed the Social Readjustment Rating Scale, or SSR, SRRS, consisting of 43 life events that require varying degrees of personal readjustment. They proposed that life events can add up over time and that experiencing a cluster of stressful life events decreases one's risk of, uh, or I'm sorry, that if you experience a cluster of stressful events that increases your risk of developing physical illnesses. So for example, a death of a spouse, retirement or moving, um, and, but the list also contains happy life events too. So like getting married or retirement. So you stress is still stress. Research shows that accumulating many points in a short time is very bad for you. But uh, conversely, critics say the scale doesn't take appraisal of events into account. Um, oh, also I should mention too, the death of a spouse is the most traumatic event on the scale. And that's followed by divorce as the second most. What about daily hassles? Well, those involve the minor irritations and annoyances that are a part of our everyday lives. Examples include rush hour traffic, which I don't have to deal with, lost keys, obnoxious coworkers, inclement weather, arguments with friends and family. Researchers have demonstrated that the frequency of daily hassles is actually a better predictor of both physical and psychological health than our life change units. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, I walk to work every day, which is a change for me within the last year. I used to have to drive to work. I lived much further away, and that has been uh, bliss. Some jobs are just inherently stressful. So firefighters and police officers have stressful jobs, as do EMTs. They never know what they're going to roll up into. Stressors can be connected to work, and a heavy workload and uncertainty about or lack of control over certain aspects of your job can lead to stress. Job strain is a work situation that combines excessive job demands and workload with little discretion in decision-making or job control. Job burnout, which is a general sense of emotional exhaustion and cynicism in relation to one's job, and depression uh, also often occurs with job burnout. Physical disorders or diseases whose symptoms are brought about or worsened by stress and emotional factors are called psychophysiological disorders. Physical symptoms are real and produced or exacerbated by psychological factors. Research shows that personality characteristics like depression, anxiety, and anger are a factor for chronic health problems. The immune system is like the body's surveillance system, and you can mistake, or it can mistake your body's own healthy cells for invaders and attack them, and that's what's called an autoimmune disease. Um, you could also have issues with immunosuppression, which is when the immune system breaks down and is unable to do its job. Uh, psychoneuroimmunology is a field that studies how psychological factors such as stress influence the immune system and immune system functioning. And people with chronic stressors are, more, for example, people with chronic stressors are more likely to develop colds. Cardiovascular disorders uh, involve the heart. And heart disease is the leading cause of death in the developed world. It is about one in three deaths in the United States. 
Hypertension is another term for high blood pressure, and it's a major risk factor for heart disease. The for it forces the heart to pump harder, and that puts more physical strain on the heart. And uh, hypertension is scary because it has no symptoms. The risk factors to cardiovascular disorders are aging, income, education, employment status, and there's also behavioral risk factors such as having an unhealthy diet, using tobacco, physical inactivity, and alcohol consumption. Friedman and Roseman believed, uh, Rosenman believed that people uh, prone to heart disease think, act, and feel differently than those who do not, uh, or who aren't um, um, prone to heart disease. And they come up with this idea of type A and type B people. So type A people are intensely driven, type B people are laid back and relaxed. So type A people want to achieve more and more in less and less time. So they're very competitive, they have time urgency, they're impatient, and they're frequently hostile. And it's the anger hostility dimension of type A behavior that may be one of the most important factors in the development of heart disease. So hostility and social strain form a cycle of antagonistic interactions with others. Now related to this is something called negative affectivity, which is a tendency to experience distressed emotional states involving anger, contempt, disgust, guilt, fear, and nervousness. And that's been linked uh, with the development of both hypertension and heart disease. What about depression and heart disease? Well, a study in the late 1970s looked at over 8,000 manic depressive persons in Denmark, and they found a 50% increase in deaths from heart disease among those patients. Patients with heart disease have more depression than the general population, and people with depression are more likely to eventually develop heart disease. The more severe the depression, the higher the risk. Depression, especially if it occurs early in life, may increase the likelihood of living an unhealthy lifestyle. Well, let's talk about asthma. Asthma is a chronic disease in which the airways of the respiratory system become obstructed, leading to great difficulty expelling air from the lungs. Airway obstruction is caused by an inflammation of the airways and a tightening of the muscles around them. It affects 18, over 18 million U.S. adults and accounts for about 4,000 deaths per year. Asthma attacks are often triggered by environmental factors such as air pollution, allergens, cigarette smoke, uh, airway infections, cold air, or a sudden change in temperature, and exercise. Migraine headaches are a type of headache thought to be caused by blood vessel swelling and increased blood flow. Migraines are characterized by severe pain in uh, one or both sides of the head, an upset stomach, and disturbed vision, and they're more frequently experienced by women than men. In the U.S., over one-third of the population experiences tension headaches each year, and 2-3% to of the population suffers from chronic tension headaches. So we've been talking about stress, but how do we deal with stress? Well, coping refers to mental and behavioral efforts that we use to deal with problems relating to stress. In problem-focused coping, one attempts to manage or alter the problem that is causing one to experience stress. This typically involves identifying the problem, considering possible solutions, weighing the cost and benefits of those solutions, and then selecting an alternative. And by using a, a problem-focused coping, we actively try to do things to address the problem. So it's more likely to be used when you're encountering stressors that you perceive as controllable. Emotion-focused coping consists of efforts to change or reduce the negative emotions associated with stress. And these efforts may include avoiding, minimizing, or distancing oneself from the problem, or seeking something positive in a negative event. So you might say, well, I got fired from my job, but now I can spend more time on my acting career, trying to look on the bright side. In a certain sense, emotional focused coping can be thought of as treating the symptoms rather than the actual cause. And it's often used if we're powerless or dealing with uncontrollable stressors. Perceived stress 
is our beliefs about our personal capacity to exert influence over and shape outcomes and has major implications for our health and happiness. Extensive research has demonstrated that perceptions of personal control are associated with a variety of favorable outcomes, such as better physical and mental health and greater psychological well-being. Greater personal control is also associated with lower reactivity to stressors in daily life. Let's talk about some studies that were done by Martin Seligman, and this is the learned helplessness paradigm. He conducted a series of classic experiments in the 1960s in which dogs were placed in a chamber where they received electric shocks from which they could not escape. Later, when the dogs were given the opportunity to escape by jumping across a partition, most failed to even try. They seemed to just give up and passively accept any shocks the experimenters chose to administer to them. They had learned helplessness. In comparison, dogs who were previously allowed to, es allowed to escape the painful shocks tended to jump the partition to escape the pain. So Seligman concluded that believing that you're powerless over negative events is a lot like depression in humans. So bad things happen, like failing a test, and someone make, might make an attribution that they're not smart, that nothing's going to change, and that this is just another example of the fact that they're not smart. And this is not a healthy stream of thought. That's, it's thinking like um, uh, a depressed person. The link between perceived control and health may provide an explanation for the frequently observed relationship between social class and health outcomes. In general, research has found that more affluent individuals experience better health, mainly because they tend to believe that they can personally control and manage their reactions to life's stressors. The affluent also believe that their votes have greater sway in elections, uh, and so they tend to vote at higher rates. So uh, taken all together, vote early and often, and apparently you should be rich. Um, Hemingway once said, uh, uh, the rich are different from the rest of us. They have more money. That's paraphrasing. So building strong interpersonal relationships helps us establish a network of close, caring individuals who can provide support in times of distress, sorrow, and fear. And so social support is the soothing impact of friends, family, and acquaintances. And it can take many forms, such as advice, guidance, encouragement, acceptance, emotional comfort, tangible, um, and tangible assistance, so like borrowing money from people. And elephants are pictured there because if an elephant is stressed, another will comfort that uh, elephant uh, with physical contact. So a trunk touch goes a long way. Isolated men and women are more than two times more likely to die and uh, develop cardiovascular disease and colds. Research shows that in stressful situations, people have lower blood pressure when a friend is present versus when they're alone or if they're with a stranger. So that's the power of social support. Exercise is beneficial for both physical and mental health, and physically fit individuals are more resistant to the adverse effects of stress. Exercise also prevents telomere shortening, which, which means that you look younger if you exercise. The relaxation response technique is a stress reduction method that combines relaxation with transcendental meditation. And biofeedback uses electronic equipment to accurately measure a person's neuromuscular and autonomic activity. Feedback is provided in the form of visual or auditory signals. So the idea is that biofeedback allows people to develop strategies that help them gain some level of voluntary control over involuntary bodily processes, processes. And that's been applied successfully for people with headaches, asthma, high blood pressure, and phobias. Well, let's switch gears again and talk about happiness. So some psychologists have said that happiness consists of three distinct elements, the pleasant life, the good life, and the meaningful life. So the pleasant life is the, uh, made up of the day-to-day -day pleasures that add up to joy. The good life is in, uh, when you're engaging your talents to enrich your life through recreation or your work. And the meaningful life is when we use our talents to serve the greater good. 
Happiness can be defined as an enduring state of mind consisting of joy, contentment, and other positive emotions, plus the sense that your life has meaning and value. The five happiest countries are all Nordic countries, I guess excluding Switzerland and the Netherlands. The United States is 17th happiest on the list, and people in sub-Saharan Africa were reported to be the least happy. 52% of U.S. adults report themselves as being very happy, and 8 in 10 are very satisfied with their lives. What factors contribute uh, or are connected to happiness? Well, life satisfaction increases the older people get. Whoops, I'm sorry, I'm on to this one now. Married people are happier than unmarried people, and uh, happy people indicate that their marriages are fulfilling. Actually, satisfaction with marriage and family life is the strongest predictor of happiness. Happy people have more friends and strong social support networks. Uh, residents of affluent countries tend to be happier. And the key number there is if you make $75,000 a year, uh, you're likely to be happy or, or, or making more than that doesn't make you more happy. And the thought is that higher incomes may impair people's ability to savor the small pleasures in life like eating at Cheesecake Factory, for example. If you're a multimillionaire, maybe that's not that much of a thrill. That's a treat for me, though. Happy people are more likely to be college educated, and this is the idea that they can get more fulfilling jobs, more meaningful jobs, because they have a college education. Religiosity is correlated with happiness, but it really depends on economics. So you live, if you live in a poor country, then yes, religion is correlated with happiness. But if you're in the United States, then it's not. People without children are happier and uh, attractiveness is not strongly related to happiness. Here's a depressing statistic. Newlyweds predict that their marital satisfaction will remain stable or improve but their marital satisfaction usually declines in the next four years. That doesn't mean that yours will, though. That's those people in the study. The burst of pleasure when we see big life events like a marriage proposal, the birth of a child, inheritance, or winning the lottery occur, but dramatic life events have less long-lasting impact on your happiness because people are able to adapt to their happiness level. So, Marriage or, you know, winning the lottery or anything like that, um, your happiness remains stable. However, people are not able to adapt well to things like unemployment or severe disabilities. There are happiness interventions that you can do that um, increase happiness. And these include things like writing down three good things that happened during each day being grateful for things. So uh, as they say, that attitude of gratitude ain't just a platitude. The average national happiness scores relate to six variables, per capita GPA, so GDP, <laughs> excuse me, gross domestic, gross domestic product, not grade point average, social support, the freedom to make life decisions, healthy life expectancies, uh, freedoms from perceived corruption in government and business, and generosity. Positive psychology is the science of happiness. It seeks to identify and promote qualities that lead to greater fulfillment in our lives. It looks at people's strengths and what helps them to lead happy, contented lives, rather than focusing on things like pathology and problems. Positive psychologists study altruism, empathy, creativity, forgiveness and compassion, the importance of positive emotions, the enhancement of immune system functioning, and savoring the fleeting moments of life. Positive affect is pleasurable, pleasurable engagement with the environment. So for example, happiness, joy, enthusiasm, alertness, and excitement. And positive affect serves as a protective factor against heart disease. Now, I'm a very optimistic person, and that means that's a general tendency to look on the bright side of things. I'm actually even a member of our local optimists club, and uh, this is 100% true. My attitude towards life is the same as my blood type. Be positive. And research has linked optimism to things like longevity, 
um, healthier behaviors, fewer post-surgical complications, better immune functioning among men with prostate cancer, uh, and better treatment adherence. So uh, there's a lot of uh, positive um, implications for looking on the bright side of things. Flow is a particular experience that's so engaging and engrossing that it becomes worth doing for its own sake. And it's usually related to creative endeavors, but also to people who love their jobs. And so when pure, people experience flow, they lose themselves in the activity and effortlessly maintain their concentration and focus. I've had a, a number of students who said that they experience flow while playing video games too, that they're just completely engaged and next thing know, they know, six hours have passed. Finding an activity that you're truly enthusiastic about may be the real key to happiness. So finding something that's so absorbing that doing it is a reward in itself. And that's been teaching for me. I, I love this job. I would teach for free. Um, but I also sell books. And so all of your problems, at least all of your APA style problems, can be solved by using my Learn APA style book. So when you want to learn to write correctly or write right, consult my book and videos on Learn APA style, which are about writing in psychology and the social sciences. Have a great day and thanks for listening.